Hello, everybody, and welcome to this conversation. I'm interviewing Dr. Mash Seibel, who is also a friend. And, um, you know, I, I invited him to speak to us today because it is such an important topic. I think, like, not many people are really covering it, and we are not really discussing the whole um, idea of uh, taking uh, hormones uh, and the connection to breast cancer. In fact, the general perception is that whenever a woman takes hormones, there's a very high risk of breast cancer. And part of it started with, we're going to talk about that by the uh, Women's Health Initiative that was um, that was done some time ago, and uh, the results were published but never clarified after that. And Dr. Seibel has done a lot of work around that, and that's why I invited him today to speak with us today. Hi there. Hi, how are you? And thank you for having me. I'm awesome. And, you know, let me just get this out of the way because you've got a really interesting um, CV. And uh, this is from your book, by the way. This is Dr. Seibel's book, The Estrogen Window. We're going to be referencing that book um, throughout the interview. Uh, I got this and I have to say, like, I read it in, I would have read it in one weekend, but it was a pretty complex book, so I read it in two weekends. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Seibel, MD, is one of America's leading experts on women's wellness and menopause, a distinguished alumnus of University of Texas Medical Branch. He served on them, he actually serves, he will be serving again, right, at the Harvard Medical School faculty, um, and he has served before for 20 years. He's the editor of My Menopause Magazine, which won the Web Health Award, and he's a creator of menopausebreakthrough.com, an online blueprint that guides women through menopause. Dr. Seibel contributes to About.com, The Huffington Post, and appears regularly on all the national uh, stations like MS MSNBC, Today, Insight um, Edition, and PBS. Dr. Seibel lives in Boston with his lovely wife, who had a pleasure of meeting, Sharon. <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, you know, this is a very important subject for women, and it's important because of its impact on women, because of its impact on women's health, and because it is so confusing that I hear over and over again that women feel that it's just something they're going to tough out and deal with. And I want you you need to figure it out, not tough it out. Because if you can figure it out, you'll realize that it's really much more clarity than you ever believed. And the opportunity is there for really to take care of yourself in a way that will enhance your, your health, your happiness, and your hormone balance. And that's what we want to happen. So let me ask you the first question. Why did you write this book? Well, this book really began in many ways from a very personal perspective because at one point in time when I began my career I was one of the world's leading experts in the infertility arena. I did one of the first in vitro fertilizations in the United States and many other for some of the first ultrasounds that were done, the timing of ovulation, many other things that were very new at that time. Uh, and then what happened is my wife had surgery that threw her into early menopause. And unfortunately, uh, that happened only about seven months after the Women's Health Initiative or the WHI study came out, suggesting, and I might say incorrectly, that estrogen increases the risk of breast cancer, heart disease, and dementia. Mm -hmm. So the standard of care was really not to give estrogen. She was in early menopause and should be taking estrogen. And people were not certain what to do. And also, since I had been in practice at that point for a while, I had a number of patients who were transitioning out of the menopause, out of the fertility world and into the menopause world, perimenopause and menopause. They wanted me to be taking care of them. They wanted to know what to do. So I went about figuring it out. I didn't want her to tough it out. And so I began a journey that really took me about a decade and what's happened most remarkably is in the last couple of years in particular, this data has begun to sift out in a very interesting way. And then as editor, the magazine is called The Hot Years, My Menopause Magazine. And as editor of that, I interview experts from all over the world. And what I did was not only did I call and talk to them, but I went to major national meetings, I interviewed them individually, 
And then sometimes still things didn't come out where I could understand them. They couldn't make sense. So I would call them again. And eventually, all the pieces of the engine, they got taken apart and put on the sidewalk, finally went back into the body of it in a way that made sense. And that's what happened and why this is called the estrogen window. Because there is a window of opportunity in which women can take estrogen actually not only safely but even lower the risk of breast cancer heart disease and dementia among other things whereas if that window closes the reverse can be true mm. now this dichotomy of things is what has been so confusing because sometimes it looks like it's bad and sometimes it looks like it's good well it's not bad or good it's all about timing if you take insulin at the wrong time and your sugar is low, you're going into coma. Yeah. If you take insulin at a time when your sugar is high, you're going to balance out and you're going to live a happy and healthy life and, and have an excellent uh, balance of your blood sugar. It's so, the same with hormones. Would you like to talk about what is the window first or would you want to talk about the WHI first to set the context? Which one would you, what's, what's a better flow for you? I think I could do either way, but I think talking about the WHI leads into the window, uh, and I think that'll be helpful. Because the study, what happened was, is that when estrogen first came out, people really didn't have an idea. Until 1942, there was no estrogen. And then around, uh, by 1990, estrogen was so prevalent and so used by everyone that even they tried giving it to men to see if it would help them. I just want to say it did not, but that, that aside, they gave it to everyone. And um, what happened was people would suddenly start to uh, observe that women who were receiving estrogen seemed to have less risk of heart attacks. Mm -hmm. So they decided to do a study. The government really requested it. And they put together this WHI study in which they compared taking either estrogen plus a synthetic progesterone, Provera, or a placebo. That was the first study that was done. And the reason for that is, is that if women have a uterus, they have not had a hysterectomy, and they take estrogen alone, they have an increased risk of uterine cancer. It's a low risk, but it's there. But if you add progesterone or some type of substance that is like progesterone to that estrogen, the risk of uterine cancer is basically zero. It's 99.99999, not going to happen. So women with the uterus have to take both. Women without a uterus have to take estrogen only. So the first study was estrogen plus a progestin, a synthetic progesterone, because Oral progesterone was not available at that time when the study started, so they used a synthetic one called Provera. And they compared estrogen plus Provera with a placebo. And what happened was, the women who took the estrogen plus Provera ended up with a slight increased risk of breast cancer, heart disease, and dementia. But here's where they got it wrong. Terribly, terribly wrong. They had the uterus? No, they had their uterus, but where they got it wrong was the women who received the medication, the estrogen plus the Provera, were in general, 75% of the women were between the ages of 60 and 79. Mm. The women who got the placebo were between the ages of 50 and 59. Now, if you compare women who are 50 to 59 to women who are 60 to 79, you would expect the older women would have more medical problems, and they did. And I'm making it even worse, the women 60 to 79 had many smokers. Mm. They had, uh, many of them had, a third had high blood pressure. Many had uh, diff diabetes and other conditions that were really risk factors, known risk factors, whereas most of the 50 to 59-year-old women were healthy younger women. So you gave a placebo to healthy young women and compared it to giving estrogen plus Provera 
to 60 to 79 year olds smokers with high blood pressure and diabetes. And that is what set it up. And you can see from just this initial discussion that there's an older group where it caused a problem and a younger group where it didn't. Mm. The estrogen window is a fascinating thing because it's really in general, and this is a generalization which I can digress on and fine tune for you because it differs for different organs of your body. But as a generalization, the estrogen window is roughly a 10 year window of time. And in general, it's between the ages of 50 and 59, which is what happened with that initial WHI. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about it is, is that there are women who go into menopause before 50. Those women, in fact, constitute about 5 to 10% of women go into menopause before age 45. One in 100 goes into menopause before age 40. One in a thousand goes into menopause before age 30. Mm. And one in 10,000 goes into menopause before age 20. Wow. So the first thing I want to emphasize here is menopause is not about an age. It's about transition. It's about the transition of your body from a reproductive point of time and hormonal balance when estrogen and progesterone are high to a post reproductive time when hormone levels first fluctuate and then get low. So I want to make sure you understand it. menopause is not about age. So women who are going into early menopause really need to start the estrogen early. Right. And that is going to save them so much. We can talk about that uh, later, the impact of not doing that but it's significantly negative not to be taking it. Can we talk about that's and, and how long for? If you are, it depends. So if you are, let's just keep it simple right now at the women who uh, are, we will just talk uh, 50 to 59. We'll start there and we'll work backwards. Okay. The women in general, have to decide how long to take it based on their level of risk for heart disease. So if you're a healthy woman and you have had a hysterectomy, your uterus has been removed, then you can take estrogen and you're at low risk of heart disease, meaning you're not diabetic, you're not a smoker, you don't have high blood pressure, you're not terrifically overweight, you don't have a lot of risk factors, you could probably take estrogen then for 10 years and reevaluate. A study came out not too long ago, a Finnish study, on 500,000 women, showing that women who are in good health actually can take it probably longer. So the window will probably be extended for those women. If you have a severe risk of heart disease, then it becomes much more of a risk for you. If you have a uterus and you have not had a hysterectomy, then probably there, if you're at low risk of having heart disease, then I consider it then, first of all, a five-year renewable option. Probably can take it for 10 years, but you wanna take it five at a time. And the second point is, is you're better off taking what's called transdermal estrogen, one on the skin, because it doesn't pass through your digestive tract and increase clotting factors that could put you at risk for blood clots, stroke, heart attacks, and so forth. So in general, uh, an oral one is less optimum for a woman on uh, estrogen plus progestin. And if she is gonna take an oral one, then she should be taking a lower dose of it. So just one clarification, when you said women with no uterus, what about the ovaries? You were talking about when no uterus, no ovaries either, or do they still have ovaries left? It doesn't matter. About, uh, you know, between 45 uh, and 35 at that early point, you have to realize that one in nine women are going to have had a hysterectomy already. Mm. And their ovaries may be left in. But here's the thing. If you have had a hysterectomy, you're going to have a much earlier menopause. 
because even if your ovaries are left in, people think, oh, I have my ovaries. You know, I don't have a period. I don't really know if I'm having, you know, if I have periods or not. I'm assuming my ovaries are working. They're in there, right? They are in there. But because of the compromising of the blood flow to the ovaries as a result of surgery, mm. for the most part, by seven years afterwards, uh, all women are in menopause. And in general, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty close to true. And many are in menopause at three years you know, or four years after. So you may, you may have the false belief that you're making hormones internally, but it may not be true. Yeah. Let's talk about when do we add progesterone uh, for a woman? Who should be adding progesterone and who shouldn't? And how does a woman know that she needs progesterone? So for the one thing that's certain is that the women who need progesterone are women who have a uterus. So if you haven't had a hysterectomy, you need progesterone. Now, what I would not use is this, the, the progester, the, it's called a progestin, because it's not progesterone, it's a substance like progesterone, it's a progestin. So I would not use Provera, or medroxyprogesterone acetate, which was what was used in that first WHI, because it's about, it's an anti-estrogen. And what it does is about 300 times more potent than the natural progesterone. And it causes the estrogen receptors to be less responsive to estrogen. So you're really diminishing the, pe the positive effects of estrogen by taking that uh, Provera. But if you use a, a natural, or a, now I shouldn't say natural, bioidentical uh, progesterone, or most of the other ones, you'll be better. Uh, better served. And I want to say that bioidentical, while it does describe the uh, structure, the chemical structure, as being identical to what is made in the body, it does not imply that it's only compounded because you can get bioidentical hormones, estrogen and progesterone, from the chain drug stores as well as the, um, as the compounding drug stores. And the reason that this matters is because even though the compounding drug stores do a great job and they fill a lot of prescriptions and they individualize things that people need, what's coming out now is an increasing evidence from uh, studies in which they take the same prescription and send it to a dozen compounding pharmacies, and then they take the received filled prescription and send that to a chemical analysis lab. And in general, the estrogen comes back somewhere around 80 to 200% higher than what was ordered. Wow. And the progesterone comes back about 60 to 80% less than what was ordered, even though they filled it correctly. Mm. It's kind of like when you put the M&Ms in your ice cream at the ice cream store and you stir it up and then you get a scoop. Sometimes you get a lot of M&Ms and sometimes you don't get any. You know? And so what happens is, is that there's cases coming in the literature now there was just a report of four women who had uterine cancer taking estrogen and progesterone, which was made at compounding pharmacies. And the reason is, is because they do their best to fill them correctly, but the actual stuff that it's in is not giving the patient what she was expecting to get. So they're over estrogenizing and under progesterone, uh, getting under treated with progesterone. And that's a real potential risk that women need to understand because estrogen from compounding stores, uh, drug stores, isn't safer. Mm. So what is the alternative? What, what do you recommend? Like when somebody comes and sees you as a patient, which by the way, you're going to start seeing patients again at Harvard, right? You said? Yeah, be at um, Beth Israel Hospital. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, what do you, uh, what's the alternative to compound it? Uh, by well, you can get almost any dose at any regular drugstore, CVS, Walgreens, Eckerd, Rite Aid. I mean, any one of them, you can get the same bioidentical estrogen at the regular drugstore, but those are FDA approved. Whereas the compounded ones are not FDA approved, nor are they regulated in any way. 
They've only just begun to have any regulation in the last couple of years. So that's the problem. They're doing, I'm not putting them down. There's many things that they do we can't get at regular drugstores. They can put specific amounts or put things together in certain ways. They do a lot of good. But in this area, there is a risk that women should be aware of that they don't have awareness of. You know, they just yeah. go in and they think, well, it's got to be good. It's natural. It's not natural. The only plant that estrogen comes from is the chemical plant. I don't care where you get it. The body cannot convert plants into hormones. Can't do it. We don't have the enzymes. So that brings me to the question that we get on a daily basis. Do wild yams work? They're wonderful with your turkey at Thanksgiving. I recommend, I like them with the, you know, with, I like them with pineapple and a little bit of, but, you know, you cannot take yams and convert them into um, progesterone or estrogen. Now, they do potentially, Mexican wild yams is the place, the uh, dysogenes is the, uh, the species, a variety in which they got the actual precursor hormones. That part is totally true. But you cannot get, uh, your body cannot convert it. That's the problem. So now that doesn't take away that there can be a placebo effect because there's certainly benefits to believing something. Mm. But as far as the actual fact, it's better to get it from a traditional drugstore. And they now have progesterone available as oral, it becomes micronized, meaning it's kind of broken down so it's easily absorbed from the intestinal tract, and they come in gel caps typically, or they can come in, uh, you know, in creams or other things, but they're they, there's one that's a patch. But it's primarily, uh, it's all FDA regulated, so if you get a dose of 100 milligrams or 2 milligrams, whatever you order, or your doctor orders, you're going to get that. And that's the risk. It's not that the other stuff is bad. It's that it's not being given to you in the dose that was rec uh, ordered. Yeah. Um, so just for my own knowledge, because I, I actually don't know the answer to that, what are bioidentical hormones made of? The stuff that works, the one that, like, what is that made of? They just make, it's like a chemical... It has a structure, you know, when you were in chemistry, remember all those chicken wire structures that yeah. you saw for, you know, steroids? Yeah. Well, basically it's a steroid. Uh, estrogen is a C18, uh, a C18 chain and uh, our structure. And, uh, you know, estradiol has two hydroxyl groups on it. Estrone or E1 has one hydroxyl group. So it's just a matter of they chemically construct these in, in the chemistry lab right. in, in, from precursor. They start with cholesterol or something like that, take it through a series of chain reactions, and then it comes out as whatever the, the substance is, estradiol, estrone, estriol, those are the three. But that's what you get. Yeah. So it's, it, estradiol is the, the most potent and the, and the one that's primarily from the ovaries. And I just want to do a quick shout out for you again for the book. For those of you who are joining us a little bit later, Estrogen Window is a book I highly recommend for anybody who's going, headed towards menopause, going through menopause. Dr. Siebel just really breaks it down in such a um, really straightforward way of who should, who should not be taking what, um, why, are, why are the fears not, when the fears are right, when the fears are not, when we shouldn't be fearing um, estrogens. Um, there is also a section of herbs and food, which I truly appreciate as well. Um, a mention of those. Really great book. I think debunking a lot. In fact, um, do you know, I actually realized that only after um, just a, a week ago that my review was here, right there, is on the, um, right on, there, on, on the cover here on the sleeve. And I wrote here, Dr. Seibel does estrogen and hormone replacement therapy what other breakthrough thinkers did to our fear of fats, debunk, educate, and assure that there is a time and place for the vilified estrogen a must have in any woman's library. So, um, you know, one other thing I would like to <clears throat> talk about, which I think is big, um, actually a couple of things, because you also, one thing before I forget, I also want to, let's talk about this actually. What happens when a woman, because of fear, doesn't go on estrogen, because of all the WHI results, mm -hmm. because of the fear that doctors um, have been instilling in us without proper um, reframe or 
education with it. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? What happens when we don't take estrogen when we need it? Well, that's an important question because 100% they're going to be women who either cannot or will not take estrogen. And absolutely, I completely support that decision as long as that it's been made with the knowledge of what the facts are and they've decided just anyway that that's their decision, then God bless. That's what people should be able to do. So this is a very important concept because one thing that I believe is that whether or not you take estrogen, you must take care of the some of you. You must take care of the S-U-M, the some of you, and not just some of you. And if all you do is take hormones and you don't take care of the some of you, you're not going to have an optimal experience in menopause and beyond because there's much more than just taking a pill or a patch or a cream or something like that. So what happens is when you choose not to take estrogen, then what you are doing is shifting the importance of the other components. And this is all part of my menopause breakthrough uh, program that I do because I believe there are five things that women need to address in order to optimize their lives, whether or not they take estrogen. Number one is they have to understand the physical things that are going to happen, and they can happen, and likely some of them are going to happen, and know how to address them. The second thing is there's going to be some emotional transitions, and it's very fascinating what happens to the brain and our, the woman's ability to think and to uh, function and react and, and emotionally how she feels and so forth, so the emotional parts. The third are lifestyle things, habits that you must optimize in order to have a positive experience with or without estrogen. And for me, the four legs, the pillars are you must have less stress in your life. You have to have more sleep in your life. You have to eat well, which you certainly know a lot about, and you have to exercise. Okay, These are very important components of your life, plus or minus estrogen. Then you must know about estrogen and the alternatives to estrogen because there are uh, prescription and non-prescription options to estrogen. And then finally, you have to know how to thrive beyond menopause because there are body, mind, and spirit components of this time of life, of every time of life actually, but of this time of life. And the things that are important to include in the body there are things like the hot flashes. There are things like the intimacy and sexuality, which can change. We could talk about that. There, there's things that have to do with uh, a sensitive bladder because this affects half of women at this time. Diabetes is much more common in women at this point in time. And so all of these things have to be addressed. Then in the mind, there has to be a positive mindset. There has to be an incorporation of mindfulness, yoga, and meditation, and other things. And then there has to be an understanding of dementia and what the risks are and how to kind of put those things at a lowest possible level. And finally, there's the concept of spirituality, a connection to something higher. Because all of these things are going to give hope, faith, and optimism at a time when things could be lower than they could could or you would like them to be. And all of this is the sum of you. And whether or not you take hormones, you have to really recognize the potential benefits that you can get from addressing these things in a proactive way. Do you see women ever um, refusing to take hormones and then really cleaning out their life in a sense that removing a majority of the stressors, as in no financial stressors, good quality sleep, take care of themselves, love themselves, have a spiritual practice. And with that de-stressing and, and having a sense, strong sense of purpose in life, their adrenals are in a really good place. And do you ever see women's adrenals being able to step in and produce a sufficient amount of estrogen to mitigate those risks and make them feel good? Well, where the, I think that that would be an unlikely source of sufficient estrogen. But having said that, if all of those things are as you spoke, that person would be the most likely to be doing extremely well in menopause. And some women are very fortunate. Not everyone has all of these symptoms that people fear. Now, 
if a woman goes into early menopause, and I'm talking about before age 46, mm. and definitely before age 40, I'm going to tell you point blankedly, please consider estrogen because the risk of heart disease go up over 30%. The risk of dementia can go up as much as 70 70%. Wow. The risks of even moodiness, depression, and the risk of suicide go up by 5 to 10%. Mm -hmm. This is serious stuff in this early, uh, and the risk of heart attacks mm -hmm. go up quite a bit in young women, particularly if the menopause came from surgical menopause, as what's happening with all of these women who are now having genetic causes of or risk factors and are going through uh, removal of their ovaries to prevent, most often it's breast cancer or ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. This is a really important issue for you. I've, I'm actually going to be giving a keynote address about this in a few months. And it's uh, very important to understand because even if you have the breast cancer gene, the BRCA gene, even if you have the cancer gene that causes breast cancer and you take estrogen, it doesn't increase your risk of getting breast cancer over not taking it. This is really important. Mm -hmm. This is really, really, really important because first of all, the suffering, but also the increased risk that comes from not being aware. And I can't tell you how many women I talk to about this on an ongoing basis, who are finding that their doctors won't give them the medication, or they themselves are reluctant to take it if the doctor wants to. And there was just an article in the New England Journal a few months ago, which talked about what's going on in the country as a result of, women's, of the Women's Health Initiative study. Because today, there are 80% less women taking estrogen than there were in 2002 when that study came out, 80% less. Now, as a result of that, we have a generation of doctors who are not accustomed to taking care of women in menopause or teaching about or treating them with hormones. Yeah. So the younger doctors in particular, but many of the older doctors who have been uh, of the belief they heard the story about the Women's Health Initiative, there's nothing new to learn, they got it, are unfortunately still misinformed. That's a real problem for the women today. And the reason it's a problem is not only for their health, but also for their well-being and also for their productivity. I'll give you some examples here. As a result of not taking estrogen, the women that score lowest in productivity in the workplace are the 49 and over. Now, these are women who are at the peak of their life. These are women who got the smarts, the experience, the wisdom, but they're symptomatic and it's, they're having, they're struggling. In another study in which Fortune 500 women were evaluated, 500,000 women, Fortune 500 companies, they all had the diagnosis of hot flashes, just one symptom. Half of those women were treating their hot flashes, and half of those women were not treating their flash, hot flashes. The women who did not treat their hot flashes went to the doctor, on average, six more times per year than the women who treated them and this was a cost, if you're just looking at money, $400,000 in loss of productivity and cost of doctor's fees and going. Not $400,000, $400 million. And it was also impacting their work performance. It was impacting their productivity. It was impacting their sleep, which indirectly was having an effect on the other. And as a result of that, it lowered self-esteem because they didn't feel as good. They weren't working as well. They weren't doing their job as well. They were always going to the doctor. Mm -hmm. You can't feel good about yourself in that kind of a scenario. So realize that there is an impact 
about this. And in addition, in a study that was done at the, from the, uh, department, the, the Department of Public Health at Yale, looking as an actuarial at the actual data from the original Women's Health Initiative, when they looked at the actual data and adjusted it for age, and they looked at how many women died of heart attacks, they estimated that between 40 and 50,000 women died prematurely from heart attacks as a result of not taking estrogen. Now, this is a big deal. So it's, you know, you have to get the data straight. It's yeah. very important. And that's exactly what your book is about. You straighten out the data on that. And so right. it's, you know, it's, and there's misconceptions and everything, right? You know, it's the same thing in the nutrition world. It's the same thing about the whole yeah. thing about fats, right? It's the fear of fats and, you know, and then, you know, the, the power of protein powders and shakes and I mean, all of that stuff. So to, to end our conversation, I, I want to touch on the genetic elements mm -hmm. and your take on Angelina Jolie's decision to have a, a preventative bilateral mastectomy, which was quite controversial. Um, a lot of media accused her for her career going down and that was a way to get herself back in the media. So let's talk a little bit about that. The this is a woman whose family was having breast cancer like crazy. She has like about a, she has about a 65, 70% chance that she's going to get breast cancer by leaving her breasts on. Believe me, a woman that attractive is in no hurry to remove her breasts. But in addition to that, there's also, well, you're talking specifically about the breasts, but you know, it, women who don't take out their ovaries with BRCA1, for instance, by age 40, they have, their, their risk goes at age 40, their risk of having ovarian cancer with BRCA1 is about 4% that they'll be diagnosed either clinically or at the time of surgery with ovarian cancer. If they wait until they're 50, the risk of having ovarian cancer is 14%. She did what she had to do. She stood up to the plate, and then she had the confidence to tell the world to be helpful. And she did something that's very interesting. She went on estrogen because by going on estrogen, and believe me, I'm not saying everybody has to go on estrogen. I'm not all, I'm just trying to help the women get the decision made on the facts, not on fear. Mm -hmm. But by going on, on estrogen, she preserved her skin. She preserved her bladder. She preserved her intimacy. She kept her heart from getting clogged up arteries. She, she allowed herself to actually lower her risk for depression and anxiety and dementia and a whole host of other things. Every organ in her body benefited from this based on the data. And the data is very strong and solid. If people are interested to know if they are in menopause or where they are, how they compare, they can go. You can go to menopausequiz.com, menopausequiz.com, and take the quiz. It'll give you an answer where you are, and it'll give you some tips depending on what your response is. But you don't have to wonder about it. Because remember, I said, not about age, it's about transition. So at any age, a woman could be having a symptom that is telling her body, hey, you may be closer to menopause than you think. And it's just worth knowing. Is it a simple blood test that people, women can do for breakup one, breakup two? Yes. Uh -huh. You can take a blood test for that and they give you uh, results. They give you results of it. Okay. And did, did she or do you, what is the general recommendation for somebody who has that mutation? Um, is it just the breast that should be removed or is it just, or is it also the uterus? You're looking at the ovaries. What matters is, well, it depends a lot on your family history. Mm -hmm. You generally want to have, for instance, I'll just tell you from a personal thing, my wife. My wife has BRCA2. Okay, that's why she went into early menopause. Now, she's lost almost every woman in her family from ovarian cancer. She thought she was going to die before she was 50. Wow. So when this gene came out and it was clear, we talked about it. And the next month, she had her ovaries out. Because let's face it, you know, when every woman around you, you know, you lose your grandmother, your aunts, your, you know, everybody's dying. 
And her mother, for other reasons, had her ovaries removed and did not get ovarian cancer. But the interesting thing is nobody in her family, nobody, I'm going to say knock on wood, nobody has gotten breast cancer. Mm. Even though it's the breast cancer gene in her family, it manifested as ovarian cancer. Okay. So she did not have her breast removed, but she had her ovaries removed. Right. Now, for some women, particularly the BRCA1, or those women who have a family history of breast cancer that's strong, you really got to think about this. Mm. Listen, women are defined almost by their breasts. I mean, that's like, it's like, it's a really, it's personal. It's, it's, it's emotional. It, it's more than just a, you know, a, a, an oversized sweat gland, which in fact is what it is medically. It's, we're talking about the essence of identity. This is a huge, huge decision, which no one can walk into lightly, but death is a big decision. <laughs> and, and, and having the, you know, just because you have the BRCA doesn't mean you're going to get breast or ovarian cancer. It means you have in the, and over the course of your life, an 80% chance that you will. Mm. Okay. Doesn't mean you will, yeah. but you have to make that decision with your partner and your healthcare provider. And you have to look inside and outside in order to determine it and, and, and make the best choice for your body and for your, for your family. As a, as a physician, what do you, what do you wish for women that they can do right now as a form of prevention? So do, we do not have to have the conversation about what happens when breast cancer happens. Cause that's one of the things I mentioned to you in my email that drives me crazy is that we do a lot of awareness campaign as campaigns as if we didn't know about the, you know, about breast cancer by now. I think everybody does, but not many people talk about prevention. And my actually, most of my content is really focused on, on, on prevention because there's so much things that we can do nutritionally, spiritually, uh, the skincare products we are using, the stuff that we're cooking with. So we, you know, we, I'm doing that as a separate segment, but speaking to you as a physician, what do you wish for women that I can do today that we do not have this conversation further down the road about cancer? Well, unfortunately, cancer is not going anywhere. And breast cancer is like, like in colon cancer, you can find a polyp and remove it before it's cancer. But in breast cancer, you're looking at early detection. So what can you do to lower the risk? I think that what you eat makes a big difference. And I think that's important. I think that exercise lowers the risk of breast cancer. I don't think it. I know it. That's what the data shows. So exercising regularly, keeping your weight in control. These are important things to help. In fact, the women who, had, who took estrogen only in their estrogen window actually had a 23% lower risk of breast cancer than the women who didn't take it. Right. So estrogen may be part of that equation. And I think routine and regular uh, examinations and, you know, and discussions with your doctor, if you have a strong family history, you have to consider genetic testing. And there's not only the BRCA, there's probably almost a dozen other ones that are also available if you have a strong family history to get genetic counseling and be vigilant. I mean, you don't have to live in fear, but you have to live in wisdom and you have to go forward, you know, vigilantly and, and, and anticipate. But nutrition, exercise, uh, and lifestyle have, a, I think, a lot to to play because even if you have that gene, remember some people don't express that gene and don't get it. And everything that you can do to live healthy is going to further reduce the likelihood, even if you have those genes, that you're going to be one of the people that gets that disease. Awesome. Um, we talked about the book. It's available in most health stores. I take it, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, and on Amazon, of course. The, the estrogen window. I think every woman who's got who's heading for menopause and menopause should get that. You also talked about the program that you have, menopausebreakthrough.com. Can you tell us about what's in the book and what's in that online program? And I know you do have a free webinar on that as well. So what's the difference between those two? Well, the book is really a total explanation 
of how to understand hormones, estrogen, the risks that it could pose, and the benefits. And really, even at the end, explains to you how to talk to your doctor about this because, you know, when you get your eight minutes, sometimes you get pretty nervous. And a lot of people walk out and they go, hey, I forgot to ask the most important thing. So what it does is it, it sets you up to be prepared for that visit. Uh, and it explains it so you make an informed choice. I mean, good health is not an accident. You know, it's really, it's a, uh, it's a preparation. And then um, the online course is really module four is all about estrogen and the hormones, but the, the course is actually a, a five week course. And in that course, I go through, you know, the physical changes and what to do. There's the, the emotional ones, the lifestyle changes, hormones or not, and thriving beyond, which I mentioned earlier. And then I also give, I also spend, uh, I do six monthly calls with people and six weekly calls with people. You get a lot of time to get your stuff talked right. about. So people can actually have access to you and talk to you in person. Yeah. That's awesome. And actually, in the back of the book, there's an opportunity to get a huge discount on it because my goal right now is to reach as many women as I can. If it weren't for the fact that it takes so much of my time, I would be happy for everyone to just do it. But it takes a lot of my time to support this. But I'm very much in favor of this kind of information because I know what it was like being a spouse and having to go through all of this stuff on that side, plus being a physician and knowing that as much as I was trying, I couldn't get the right information. I had to search and search to get this down. And I want to share that with as many people as I can. Thank you. It was really good talking to you. It's really lovely talking with you too.